Hi everyone, my name is Tom Pettit and welcome back to another episode of Beyond Come Follow Me. This week in your Come Follow Me lesson, you are studying the doctrine that is found in sections 81, 82, and 83. And for a minute here, I'm going to share with you some of the historical background and context of what's going on in Kirtland and in Joseph's life and the lives of others that led to these revelations being received. Pictured here behind me is a room known as the School of the Prophets. Uh, the School of the Prophets is a location. It's also a group of individuals. The group was nicknamed the School of the Prophets, where they came to learn and be instructed. But it's also a location. That location being this small, ten, somewhat 10 foot by 14 foot room that was on the second floor of the Newell K. Whitney store in Kirtland, Ohio. Uh, if you go out this door and, and just through the little corridor area, you find the bedroom where Joseph and Emma and their newborn, Joseph Smith III, uh, was living along with uh, their adopted daughter, Julia. Uh, through another door of that little corridor just outside this room, uh, you'll find an office space that Joseph used where to meet with the First Presidency and other leaders of the church to conduct the affairs of the church and where he also received a lot of revelations that are currently recorded in the Doctrine and Covenants, including these three that we're studying now. But the reason that I have the School of the Prophets, of all the rooms where Joseph and Emma were living and working in during this time in church history, I chose this background because of what happens in section 81. The things that are recorded in section 81 actually took place in this room. Now, maybe the revelation wasn't received in this room, maybe it was in the adjoining room where Joseph, Joseph's office is, but the events, what took place because of section 81, took place in this room. And this room is very sacred. And I'm excited to share with you the sacred story of what took place in here one day. Joseph told those in attendance, if you spiritually prepare yourself, you'll, you'll receive a divine manifestation. And many of them did. But let's get into it. So, what was the School of the Prophets? You can look at section 88, which is not a section we're studying right now, but in section 88, right down at the bottom, verses 127 all the way to the end, 141. Incredibly long section. But in those verses, the Lord describes exactly what is to take place inside the School of the Prophets. And He gives very detailed. He gets detailed as to um, uh, things that they'll say, things that they'll do. And I, I won't spoil it for you. You go study it on your own. And of course, when we get to section 88 here in a couple of weeks, I'll dive in deeper into it. But that's to get you started. Some of the things that also occurred in the School of the Prophets is they learned secular knowledge as well as spiritual knowledge and doctrine. They, of course, they studied the doctrine. They were taught by the prophet how to be future leaders of the church, how to be missionaries, how to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world and to lead others towards Christ in doing so. The, the secular things, which might surprise you, that they also learned here in this room, were things like reading, writing, math. They also studied languages. They even had a Hebrew scholar come in on several occasions to teach the men Hebrew so that they could read from the Hebrew Bible, as many of them wanted to do. So a lot of things took place in this room, but perhaps nothing more significant than what I'm going to share with you in regards to section 81. Now, in the section heading of section 81, we, we read that this was a step toward the formal organization of the First Presidency. So, section 81 comes, the Lord says, members of the First Presidency are to do this. In just seven short verses, the Lord outlines exactly what the members of the First Presidency are to do, what their job is, what their assignment is, what they're really called to do. And that being the step that would lead to the formal organization. Of course, we've had Joseph living in Palmyra, New York, Manchester, New York, Harmony, Pennsylvania, Fayette. He's now been in Kirtland at the Whitney home. We've spent some time over the last few weeks talking about when he and Emma spent a year down in Hiram, Ohio at the Johnson farm. And now here he is back living in the Whitney store in Kirtland in the upstairs. He's not living in the store. He's, he's upstairs where there's a, a bedroom and living space and, and they've got a kitchen off the back and whatnot. So they've, it's like a mother-in-law's apartment there at the store, but upstairs. So they've been all over experiencing a lot of wonderful things. A lot of restoration was going on. But I, I take you briefly through that history to explain now where we are, the beginning of the 1830s. It's 1833 
and we've experienced and restored so much and now it's time to start putting organization together so we've got knowledge we've got power we've got authority and and now we're going to start to formulate structure now the the authority and the power that came with the restoration of the priesthood and with knowledge and whatnot uh, but but now we'll, we'll uh, uh, and, and so that was always there um, that's not being organized now but just the functionality of how the church is going to work the church government or leadership and the first step is to put a first presidency in place and so the very first first presidency of this dispensation is going to be called and sustained and set apart in this room behind me and so this is the location of the first solemn assembly now many of you perhaps have participated in a solemn assembly many of you have probably participated in several the most recent of course came after the passing of president monson when we in general conference as a worldwide church participated virtually or in person we all participated in the sustaining of president nelson as prophet seer and revelator and president of the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints dallin h oaks as first counselor and Henry B. Eyring as second counselor, the three of them making up the first presidency of the church. And we sustained him, we, them. We put our hands to the square and raised them high, saying, yes, we sustain and support and commit to follow the counsel that they give to us, which will lead us towards our Savior, Jesus Christ. That which we have experienced as members of the church happened in this little teeny tiny room about 10 feet by 14 foot is all that it is and a few men gathered here to be a part of that first solemn assembly. Leading up to it, the Lord outlines in section 81 exactly what a counselor in the first presidency is to do. Now, before I highlight a couple of things, I'd like to make mention of the historical note that when Section 81 was first received, it did not use the name Frederick G. Williams. It had the name Jesse Gauss. I think I'm saying the last name right. And Jesse Gauss was, was called originally to take part in that first first presidency. He fell away from the church. And so the Lord called Frederick G. Williams in his place. Well, Section 81 had the wrong name in it. So here's what we learn. And this is a wonderful eternal doctrinal truth. The Lord instructed Joseph to remove the name Jesse Gauss and insert Frederick G. Williams. Now, did the Lord make a mistake and call the wrong person? Of course not. The Lord, through this simple example, this simple historical story, we see exactly how the Lord works. Whose church is it? It's His. Who leads the church? The Lord does. And so whether the name is Jesse Gauss or Frederick G. Williams or Dallin H. Oaks, it is kind of irrelevant because the individual who stands as a member of the First Presidency is to follow these instructions as outlined in Section 81, regardless of who the individual is. So at the next solemn assembly, when we sustain a new first presidency, we can look back and, and take that new counselor or two counselors' names and insert them for Frederick G. Williams. The instruction is the same. The blessing and benefit to the members of the church for sustaining a new first presidency remains the same. Nephi says, like in the scriptures to yourself, the Lord's just doing that. The Lord's saying, hey, Jesse Gauss, if you're going to serve in the first presidency, th these are the expectations. Oh, and Frederick G. Williams, you've got the exact same expectations. And same with you, Henry B. Eyring, and Sidney Rigdon, and whoever it might be. So with that in mind, let's take a look here. In verse 2, so he's starting to command the counselor in the first presidency, uh, talking about the president, unto whom I have given keys of the kingdom, which belong always unto the presidency of the high priesthood. So that's the president. Now we've got our counselors. And so we start moving down, and we get halfway through verse 3, and he's, he's speaking specifically to the counselors in the first presidency. In, uh, this is what you do in thy ministry in proclaiming the gospel in the land of the living and among thy brethren. And in doing these things, that will do the greatest good unto thy fellow beings and will promote the glory of him who is your father. So what's their job? They're supposed to proclaim the gospel 
and they're supposed to promote the glory of Him. Teach the gospel and testify of the reality of, of the living reality of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you start to think about some conference talks that we hear from counselors in the First Presidency. Regardless of the topic, we can laser focus their words back to two common things that they're talking about always, and that is proclaiming the gospel and testifying of the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verse 5, some commandments of things to also do. Wherefore, be faithful. Stand in the office which I have appointed unto you. And then here, succor the weak, lift up the hands which hang down, and strengthen the feeble knees. And you might think for a moment about a recent conference address. And if it's real recent, you would think of President Oaks or President Eyring. Did their words sink into your soul? And as a result, did they strengthen you? Did their words and testimony lift you up? Did they strengthen your feeble knees? And if you can think and say yes, well, then our two counselors and our current first presidency are doing exactly what the Lord asked them to do. So I see two blessings and benefits here. One, the instruction given to the first presidency. First presidency members, this is what you're to do. Thank goodness that the Lord has outlined exactly what they need to do, giving them very specific instructions as to how to fulfill their calling. Because that way, if they are fulfilling their calling, then the second blessing comes directly to us. And that is that we can be lifted and strengthened and succored because of the words, because of their testimonies, because of their actions, because of the love that we can feel coming from them through our TV screens or through the magazine article as we're reading it or as we're reading it off our smartphone as we're out and about doing whatever. In so many different ways and circumstances and times, those members of the First Presidency are providing a blessing to us. And so anytime that we feel weak, that we feel that our knees are feeble, so to speak, or that, we need, that, we're, that we're grasping, that we're looking for someone, something to take a hold of our hand and, and lift us up, in those moments of our lives, we can pull out our smartphone, our tablet, our magazines, however we can access the words of the First Presidency, and in those words that they speak, those things that we seek, those things that we desire, will be realized and granted. That's the blessing that Heavenly Father outlines in section 81. So during this first solemn assembly, they gather in this room, and according to the history of the church written by Joseph Smith, he says this. Now this is Joseph Smith speaking. What he describes happened in this room that you see behind me. Talking about, okay, we're going to for, formalize, uh, not formalize, we're going to organize formally the first, first presidency. They gather in this room and the prophet says, Accordingly, I laid my hands on Brother Sidney and Frederick and ordained them to take part with me in holding the keys of this last kingdom and to assist in the presidency of the high priesthood as my counselors, after which I exhorted the brethren. So they're set apart. We've now got a first first presidency. Joseph turns to those, the others who are gathered in the room, and he says this, after which I exhorted the brethren to faithfulness and diligence in keeping the commandments of God, and gave much instruction for the benefit of the saints, with a promise that the pure in heart should see a heavenly vision. And after remaining a short time in secret prayer, the promise was verified. For many present had the eyes of their understanding opened by the Spirit of God, so as to behold many things. I blessed the bread and wine and distributed a portion to each. Many of the brethren saw a heavenly vision of the Savior and concourses of angels and many other things of which one has a record of what he saw. Of those present in that sacred meeting that day, two brethren 
have recorded their testimony of what they experienced that day and have made it public. Now, Joseph said many people saw the Savior, and each has a record of their own. So there's other records out there, just none that I'm familiar with. But these two that I'm about to read, these two individuals were there, and they testified of what happened. Just as a very brief recap, we have a solemn assembly. Joseph administers the sacrament, and then he promises, if you're true and faithful and pure in heart, you'll see visions. You'll have a divine manifestation. Zebedee Coltrin was a recipient of that, of that promise. He says this, I saw him, and suppose the others did. And Joseph answered, That is Jesus, the Son of God, our elder brother. Then, speaking of the Father, Zebedee said, He was surrounded as with a flame of fire, which was so brilliant that I could not discover anything else but his person. I saw his hands, his legs, his feet, his eyes, nose, mouth, head, and body in the shape and form of a perfect man. This appearance was so grand and overwhelming that it seemed that I should melt down in his presence. The sensation was so powerful that it thrilled through my whole system, and I felt it in the marrow of my bones. The prophet Joseph said that this was the Father, and I saw him. We know of the appearance of God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, the boy prophet, in the year 1820 in the Sacred Grove. But that was only, I shouldn't say only, but that was one of five uh, appearances that the Father and Son would share together. There were many more um, times when the Savior would appear on His own, but five total times that the Father appeared with His Son once in the sacred grove, and now you know once here in the School of the Prophets in this little room. A couple of weeks ago we were studying section 76, and you know that in the upstairs room of the John Johnson Farm home in uh, Hiram, Ohio, that's another location where the Father appeared with the Son. Another individual who was there was John Murdoch, and he shares his experience. During the winter of 1833, we had a number of prayer meetings in the prophet's chamber. In one of those meetings, which is the one we're talking about, in one of those meetings, the prophet told us if we could humble ourselves before God and exercise strong faith, we should see the face of the Lord. And about midday, the visions of my mind were open and the eyes of my understanding were enlightened. And I saw the form of a man most lovely. The visage of his face was sound and fair as the sun his hair a bright silver gray, curled in most majestic form, his eyes a keen penetrating blue, and the skin of his neck a most beautiful white. And he was covered from neck to the feet with a loose garment, pure white, whiter than any garment I had ever seen. His countenance was most penetrating and yet most lovely. And while I was endeavoring to comprehend the whole personage from head to feet, it slipped from me. But it left on my mind the impression of love, for months that I never felt before to that degree. So John Murdoch sees Heavenly Father in this room. He describes everything, even the color of his eyes. And yet there was one characteristic that was, that was most prominent to John. The one that said, holy smokes, if, of all that he, I've witnessed, this one characteristic is what I really carried with me for the next several months. I mean, did you catch what that characteristic was? But it left on my mind the impression of love. So as John and, and also Zebedee talk about, boy, the, the glory, I felt as though, I felt it in the marrow of my bones. I felt as though I were, were to melt in his presence. And yet despite that feeling, the greater feeling was just a feeling of love being in Heavenly Father's presence. Over these last couple of weeks, the Lord has really identified Himself as a God of love. In section 76, we talked about how He revealed how merciful He is and how, how kind He is, how gracious He is, and how that was completely contrary to the Christian world way of thinking. And in some respects, it still is. And yet here we have a testimony of an individual who said, okay, not only do I, do I hear and understand the doctrine, 
comprehend the doctrine, have a testimony of the doctrine, but I've actually witnessed it. I've been to the presence of the Father, and now I'm here to teach and testify. He's recorded gratefully his testimony that, yes, it's true that God has nothing but love for his children. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, is how the, the apostle teaches the doctrine. For God so loved the world, and he does, brothers and sisters. As you now study section 82 and 83, you'll see the doctrine contained in there, the words of the Lord in sections 82 and 83. It's just the Lord reminding us how much love he has for each one of us as his children. And in section uh, 81, we, we get a, um, a, 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 the historical background will lead us to the historical background of 82 and 83. They, they were all received near the same time. And so enjoy, love the doctrinal study of sections 81 and 83 as it reminds us of how much the Lord loves us and how close the Lord is to each one of us. And don't forget, um, it's, it's July right now. We don't have a conference until next for another couple of months. But go back and take a look at specifically what did President Oaks teach and what did President Eyring teach in the last April conference and see if they match up to section 81. Put it to the test. And I'm confident that you'll see that as you read those things, you'll receive the blessings of being lifted up, inspired, strengthened by their words, because they are living prophets, seers, and revelators, serving in the first presidency along with President Nelson, the president of the church, and also one who we sustain as prophet, seer, and revelator. And these things I leave you with in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.